Welcome to CC Family. We pray today's service inspires you to walk closer to Jesus. Whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, we encourage you to subscribe and follow our pages to stay connected. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the notification bell. We're glad you're here. Praise God. So I have a word for the Lord from you. Hallelujah. We'll open our Bibles to Psalm 42, verse 5. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan to the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep, and the roars of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, and by night his song is with me, and a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony, as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So, I, I'm here to, to give you some tools, because I'm not here to motivate you. I'm here to give you, give you resources and tools that you can utilize in the nasty now and now through the trials and difficulties of life. We're more than victorious. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Amen? And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You know, the psalmist in this scripture that I just read is talking about himself. He's having a talk with his soul. He, he's actually reflecting. The reason for doing so is because he's facing difficulties these are not just trivial difficulties, they're quite complex. This is the thing, life is life, and things happen in life, but Jesus explained to his followers the following in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. There is no peace ap apart from the giver of peace and from the prince of peace, that his name is Jesus. In this world you will have, not you might have, and not his problem, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world because he overcame the world. We're also overcomers. The Bible furthermore states in Psalms 34, the righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fire ordeal that has come to you on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed if you're insulted because of the name of Christ you're blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you and if you suffer you should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler James chapter 1 verse 2 consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance faith that is not tested is not true faith Amen. this is the deal ladies and gentlemen we live in a fallen world though we're in the world we're not of this world jesus said when praying to the father in john 17 15 my prayer it's not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They're not of the world. Say with me, I am not of the world. So it's important to understand and recognize we do not belong in the world. We're, not of the, we're in it, but we're not of it. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. It's so important because if we put our hope and our trust in this world in uncertain, fallible things, you will be guaranteed disappointment after disappointment. Amen? So... They're not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So, returning back to the original scripture in Psalms 42, my tears have been my food day and night while I, people say to me all day long, where is your God? Now, the situation for the psalmist uh, was, uh, was that he was facing uh, pretty severe circumstances. It was so bad that he actually went into a state of depression. He was to the point where his anguish was so great that he was weeping day and night. His tears became his food. That means that there was no place for normal food. He actually lost his appetite. Do you know that grief will actually, and stress will produce an alteration of your appetite? Some go into not eating and some go into overeating. 
It's just a, I don't know if you have faced anything so difficult that you lose your appetite. I know I have faced similar situations, at least a time or two, if not more, in my own life. Now, it's important to realize that trial come, come, they, trials come on their own, and we don't need to provoke them. They just come on their own, right? But there are things called consequences for decisions and actions that we have taken. But this is different, but regardless of whether it's a trial or consequences, our response tends to be similar. My tears have been my food day and night. I'm reminded of King David. It was a time in his life where he had disobeyed God and he did it. He did some bad things. This was a time that his son actually had died. And I turn, uh, turn our Bibles to Second Samuel chapter 12. After Nathan the prophet had gone home, the Lord struck the child that, that Uriah's wife had born to David. And he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent nights lying on sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused. He would not eat any food with them. Now, the context of this verse, just to give you a context, is that King David had stayed in the palace at the time that he should have been in the battlefield. See, he should have been in the battlefield, but he excused himself. And he thought that he, because he was king, that he was so exempt from the duty. But if you read at the beginning of that chapter, he says it was the springtime, and it was the time that the kings went to war. You don't want to be caught dead when you're supposed to be in the battlefield. You don't want to be caught in your own palace dead when you're supposed to be in the battlefield. Amen? So, so he was taking a stroll in the roof of his palace at uh, almost at when the night was coming in, he saw Bathsheba, the wife of one of his soldiers. She des he desired her, sent for her, and slept with her. As a result, uh, Bathsheba became pregnant. And, uh, uh, and then David, to further cover up his sin, he actually had the wife of Bathsheba set up so that he would die in the battlefield. So he actually killed him, right? Uh, Eventually, Bathsheba gave birth to a son, and after this, the prophet Nathan confronted King David with his grave sin. The consequence was that the son fell ill and actually finally uh, uh, was no more. David knew that he had sinned. He took ownership of that, what he had done. He went into a period of fasting, dressing sackcloth on the ground when the child fell ill. David, ex David experienced deep anguish and regret over his actions. And that's, that's a good thing because, you know, there's a state where people get a seared conscience, meaning that they no longer feel the regret or the anguish of having done wrong. And this is a frightful place to be. You know, if you still feel the anguish when you've done something wrong, you're in a place that is healthy. Because pain will protect you. Pain will protect you. Amen. Actually, uh, leprosy, which is a disease, uh, uh, this is a bacteria that attacks the sensory nerve fibers of our bodies. And, and as a result, the person who has leprosy can no longer feel any pain. So therefore, they suffer injury after injury. And the tips of their fingers begin to, feel, to fall off. The tip of their nose fall off. Their, their eyes begin, you know, become blind because, you know, the grains of sand fall in. They cannot feel. They lost feeling. So it is with a seer conscience. It's self-destructive. Davis experienced deep anguish and regret. There is another time in the life of David where he had experienced betrayal. So he went from sinning to this time experiencing betrayal. That This is the story of a man named Ahithophel. The background to this story is that Ahithophel was a very trusted advisor to David. We find evidence of this in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23. Now in those days, the advice Ahithophel gave was like that of one who inquires of God. That was how much that's how both David and Absalom regarded all of Ahithophel's advice. Ahithophel was a man of integrity, who was very godly. He had, he had a son that was listed among David's mighty warriors. So Ahithophel, the trusted advisor, had a son that was one of David's mighty warriors. His name was um, Eliam. We find that in 2 Samuel chapter 23. But we read how Ahithophel, all of a sudden, turned against David by siding with the rebellion of Absalom. Ahithophel went from one extreme to the other. He went from giving godly advice to David to becoming his worst enemy and giving ungodly advice to Absalom, the rebellious son. If we read the scripture carefully, we will find out the connection between Ahithophel and Bathsheba. 
there is a connection between Ahithophel and Bathsheba, the man that David sinned with. Right, Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So we have established already that, that uh, Ahithophel was the father of Eliam and Eliam was the, um, and Eliam was the father of, um, of Bathsheba. So to connect the dots, when we look at Second Samuel chapter 23, we realize that Eliam is the son of Ahithophel and then we see that Eliam is the father of Bathsheba. This in effect makes Ahithophel the grandfather of Bathsheba. So now that we get a glimpse into Ahithophel's life, uh, we begin to understand. We have already reviewed how David sinned against God. We realize how his sin affected not only Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, who ended up dead, but it also have deeply affected Ahithophel, the grandfather of Bathsheba. We can safely deduct that Ahithophel was an eyewitness to the king's grave sin against his own granddaughter. Having this background information helps us to understand Ahithophel's frame of mind when he flipped on David. To recapitulate, Ahithophel has served David with distinction. He had given his son Iliam to be one of David's mighty warriors and also his son-in-law Uriah who was Bathsheba's husband to serve. David's sin had deeply negatively impacted Ahithophel. He so much did that he harbored bitterness and resentment in his heart. He nursed this offense to the degree that when Absalom rebelled against David, he readily became his advisor. But the kind of advice that now Ahithophel gave to Absalom was not godly. He actually counseled Absalom to rape David's concubines and to even kill David. So he went from being godly to now being very ungodly and evil because of an offense that had happened. And he was right in being offensive, uh, offended, but he was not right in retaining and nursing that offense. Because we can justify ourselves in just about everything. That is why God has given us the ability and the power to forgive because we have been forgiven. Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? Returning back to the original scripture where the psalmist said, My tears have been my food day and night. It describes this emotional, the emotional state of the psalmist. Psalms 55 verse 4, My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I would have the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and the storm. The psalmist is believed to have written by to be written by David when he was faced with the height of Bell's betrayal. This describes a normal reaction to a very abnormal set of circumstances. One of the things that most of us want to do when we face an awful situation is that there's any way of getting out of it. We want like that bailing out button if we could just... <laughs> If we want to go to the past and, and, and when we look upon that decision and we try to second guess ourselves and we would not have said that we, maybe we didn't do. How many have been there? Amen. Been there many, many times, right? But uh, thank God for the mercy and grace of our God. So did you realize that when he called you, he also factored in some of our own stupidity at times, right? Thank you, Jesus, for forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for the grace and the mercy of our God upon our lives. Thank you, Jesus, right? So the following verses describe how David felt. Psalms 55, 12. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. So this was someone that was close. You know, you cannot nail yourself to a cross. And people that are an arm length from you cannot nail to the cross. So those closest to you sometimes are the ones that nail to you, nail you to the cross because they have access. Amen. But you know what? You have to purpose in your heart to love. You cannot shut yourself in because if you, through offense and previous experience, you begin to build a wall, the enemy will hand you brick after brick to isolate yourself and you build a wall and all of a sudden you are there by yourself and you have blocked yourself up from people that God has assigned for your life 
Amen. To do the will of God. We can only do the will of God through relationships. How many say yes and amen? Praise God. You know what? God sends us people just like ourselves with, with perhaps that are not perfect, just like us. Amen. Praise God. Because we're not perfect. We're just forgiven. Praise God. For the psalmist, it was not the enemy from without, but the enemy from within. It was the one who's supposed to care for you. It was the one who was supposed to have your back. It was the one you had confided in this. It is the one you have been vulnerable with. I guess that gives us a clue about Jesus' betrayal by Judas, right? Judas was the one who had followed Jesus, the one who was the keeper of the purse. Jesus had treated and had given Judas the same opportunities. He gave all the other disciples. But let us not forget Peter, right? He was the one who was so intense. He was the one who told Jesus that he would never deny him. We find that in Matthew chapter 26. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee, Peter replied. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me not three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I'll never will disown you. And all of the other disciples said the same thing, but they all ran off. Peter thought he had it all together. I believe he actually meant well. He actually meant what he said at the moment. But he had too much self-confidence and not enough God confidence. That's not the way it is. Because sometimes we can declare at the moment, but when the rubber meets the road, it's another thing. That's why we need the help of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible says that the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We all know how Peter royally denied Jesus while cursing. I mean, he said, I don't know him, blankety. He really blew it, didn't he? The Bible says in Philippians 4, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, it's important to be reminded that, yes, we can do all things, but not on our own. It is through him who gives us strength. No wonder the Bible says in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. It, also, it is at times of trials and discouragement that we need to draw closer to Jesus than ever before. There's another place in the Bible where David had grown discouraged. So we find that in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Isn't that amazing that through all this, we find so many examples in the life of David. This is 1 Samuel chapter 30. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the woman and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Can you imagine weeping to the place where you run out of tears? Have you ever been there? David's two wives have been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. The context of these verses was that David had been running for his life from King Saul. He found an army of 600 men who were dis discontent and in distress. Then they vowed loyalty to David. There were a bunch of ragtag men, but they came together and David became th their leader. Achish was a Philistine king over the city of Gath. He helped, uh, this king, Philistine king, had helped David and they had a relationship, right? An amicable, amicable relationship. The Philistine king, the, the king's the Philistine kings, because there were several of them, they set out to make war against the Israelites. King Saul was so afraid to fight this vast Philistine army. King Achish had assumed that David and his 600 men would fight alongside of him against Saul and the Israelites. As they were getting ready to go to war, the other Philistine kings would not allow David and his men to join them, fearing that David would turn against them in the battlefield. After this, David then returns back home to Ziklag with his men, right? The, where their, his family and the family of these loyal men were located, and much to their shock and distress, they found that the city had been burned. Even more distressing was the fact that the Philistines had taken captive everyone in the city, including their wives and children. 
In 1 Samuel chapter 30, when David and his men reached Ziklag, like they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept out aloud until they had no strength to weep. So verse 6, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Now David and all his men wept out aloud, uh, aloud so much they had no more strength to weep. To add insult to injury, David's men were talking of stoning him. It's true, it's true the saying that says that being a leader defies the laws of gravity. Trouble flows uphill, downhill, and sideways. The men were bitter in spirit because of their sons and daughters. This was an extremely difficult situation for the men and David, who was the leader. Not only had he been running for his life from King Saul, the Philistines now did not want to have anything to do with him. His wives were taken captive, but now his own men were turning on him. They were wanting to stone him to death. The men started to blame David for their misfortune. See, it was stuff that David... It just happens, right? They were physically and emotionally exhausted. Not only were they discontented and in distress, but sometime before that, they had found David a, in, David a leader that inspired them. They found someone worthy of being followed. They did not have much in life. They had already separated from the, from the Israelites. They had formed a very tight-knit community. Their wives and children were their most valuable and prized possessions. This is who they were fighting for. Their families were worth all of the sacrifices that they were making. Now it all appeared to be lost. They became bitter in spirit. They were so distressed that they fed off each other's grief. Have you ever been around people who are just, just muttering and discontent? Look, and if you get around, that kind of stuff is contagious. It will get in your heart and you get bitter and you will find yourself muttering because it, it's a spirit of, you know, when people begin to get discontent and muttering, you know, it, it, it spreads like wildfire. But instead of muttering and complaining, we have to choose the opposite. Amen. Praise God. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Now, David was facing one of the most difficult times of his leadership. David, who himself, David who himself needed comfort and reassurance, was now in a very lonely place. The Bible says that David found strength in the Lord his God. The Hebrew word for, for strength is hazak, which means to become strong, to prevail, to harden, or to be courageous. David had no one else to turn to but God himself. At moments like this, turning to God should not be our last move but our first instinct. It needs to be our default mode. Amen. It's important to learn from David a few things about how to strengthen yourself in the Lord. And I quote to you Psalms chapter 18. And I want you to take note because you need to have a list. You need to have, you need to have a protocol. Anytime you face trials of different of various kinds, you need to have a protocol. You need to know to turn to the Word of God. That's not the moment to try to find the words. You need to have them ready. It's like a medicine in your cabinet, like in your medicine cabinet. You have a medicine that will address this particular issue. What is the prescription? Psalms chapter 18, verse 6. In my distress, I call to the Lord. I cry to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, there are people who have the wrong strongholds. They have strongholds of fear. They have strongholds of, of, of uncertainty. They have a stronghold of this Deception. They have the stronghold of this and that and the other. But you know what? The greatest and best stronghold that we could ever have is the Lord himself. Needs to be our stronghold. Amen. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? People who deal with panic attacks. People who deal with anxiety. The Lord needs to be the stronghold of your life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the, when the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who stumble and fail. It's not when the wicked against me. No, it's not if they advance against me. It's when they advance against me. 
right? Though an army beseech me, my heart will not fear. Amen. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. So he goes from an enemy. He goes to an army. Amen. And then he goes, war break out against me. Even then will I be confident. The greater the threat, the more your confidence. The greater the grief, the greater your joy. Hallelujah. Psalms 34. I will extort the, I will extort all the Lord at all times, his praise will always be on my lip. Not sometimes, not in good times, not when you're feeling blessed. Your, his praise needs to be continuously on your lips. You need to pre-program, determine in your heart and practice uh, praising the Lord at all. Say with me at all times. Say his praise needs to be always, say with me always on your lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Let the afflicted hear and what? And rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. He delivered me from all my fears. Glory. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. Hallelujah, Psalms 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock. Hallelujah. How many can testify to that? He lifted me out of the miry clay, out of the miry pit. He set my feet upon the rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Hallelujah. How many standing on solid ground? I'm on the rock. Hallelujah. I'm standing on the rock. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. He put a new song in my mouth. Say with me a new song. The first thing the enemy will try to use to take the song from your mouth. But don't quit singing. Keep singing. Keep singing. The more despair wants to come your way. Lift up your voice. Sing the songs of deliverance. Keep singing. Oh, Rababa Satarabak. His praise shall be continuously on my lips. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. See, people are watching you. Not when things are going well. It's when things are not going well. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? But when they see you singing, when you should be lamenting. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will sing because my hope is not in this world. I have seen. Hallelujah. I have looked and I have seen beyond my problems. I have seen him. Deliverance is on the way. Help is on the way. He may not look right now, but help is on the way. Psalm 56, be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit all day long. They press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long in their pride. Many are are attacking me. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. So when you're afraid, you do what? You put your trust in? I'm giving you a prescription now. I'm giving you a script now. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, and I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? How many have ever been threatened? Come on. (laughs) You ever been threatened? You know what you need to say? What can mere mortals do to me? What can mere mortals do to me? See, because sometimes we get the enemy more credit than he deserves. We give the enemy far more credit and give him more, uh, ascribe to him more power. But nothing will happen to you unless God allows it. Your steps are order of the Lord. You have to understand that. Because the enemy, he will put fear, a threat. And then we do the self-destructing. Then we begin to make these irrational decisions based on fear and not faith. Psalm 62. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from whom? From him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Hallelujah. You have a few scriptures. You need to look it up. It's going to be on YouTube, so you need to take notes. Amen. In reading these scriptures, we'll find the approach of how to draw strength from God. I know that we so far explored David's life as he underwent so many situations. But there is also a scriptural reference of the New Testament, right? Acts chapter 16, a well-known piece of scripture. Once when we were going to the palace, to the place of prayer, we were 
met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She, was, she followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews. They are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into a prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stock. stocks. Now, we're well familiar with the stories. The right of the Bible, Paul and Silas were preaching the word of God. There was a slave lady who was able to predict the future. She was so accurate that she earned much money for her owners. This evil spirit kept announcing that Paul and Silas were telling people the way to be saved. Now, this, spirit, this evil spirit was not lying. But you know what this evil spirit was doing? Because even though it was true, the evil spirit was trying to bring flattery to align itself and gain credibility so that he could make more money of the innocent people. Are you, are you seeing? So in the time of the move of God, we have to watch out for those who, who, who say, you know, nice things and adulations, but they're trying to write the coattails. Are you with me for selfish, evil purposes? How many say yes and amen? Praise God. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord. Amen. Yeah, yeah, we have to be. We, so it is the will of God that all should come to a place of repentance. Amen. But when we begin to touch the glory of God in a selfish manner for selfish purposes, God is not pleased with that. Amen. So this, so, but there was one minor detail was that the spirit was not from God. Also, the spirit was trying to gain credibility for itself of the ministry of Paul and Silas. One day, Paul had enough and commanded the evil spirit to leave this woman. The owners were upset that their cash cow was gone. They had lost their source of income. They took him to the magistrate and ordered them to be stripped and beaten, beaten with rods. It was then that they were thrown into prison. They were placed in the inner cell and their feet were fastened in the stocks. At this point, it all appeared bleak for Paul and Silas, they were doing the Lord's work, yet they had ended up in prison after being severely beaten. But in Acts chapter 16, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open. And everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison's door open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. When confronted with such awful conditions, Paul and Silas had a decision to make. They began to pray and sing songs to God instead of saying, what are we doing here? Why in the world, God, did you allow this to happen? No, they chose to pray and sing songs to God. By the time Medad arrived, Paul and Silas, who were literally beat, did not allow their pain and chains to stop them. They chose to continue praying and singing songs to God. At the midnight hour, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. The earthquake caused all of the prison prison doors to fly open, the chains to fall of the prisoners. We need to visualize that right now the prison doors did not just partially open. No, no, slowly. No, they flew open. And every chain that was designed to stay and not be broken fell off. It could not stay. Your song, your declaration, your prayer in the place of despair, God will bring you into some prisons because there are other prisoners who are listening. Hallelujah. You are there on an assignment for a temporary purpose. That's not your destiny. That's a place of passage. Hallelujah. Now all the prison doors flew 
which were security locked, flew open their prayers and songs, set off a supernatural seismic activity that caused all the prison doors to fly open and the chains to fall off. How in the world did this happen? What was the catalyst for this event? The catalyst was when Paul and Silas were confronted with severe beating and were chained in the innermost part of the prison. It happened when they decide, decided to turn their pain into prayers and songs. When you turn your pain into prayers, hallelujah, and into psalms, hallelujah, it happened when they stopped looking at their current situation and put their hope in God. It started to happen when they began to glorify the one who cannot be jailed or silenced. It happened when their faith saw beyond their prison and beheld the beauty of the Lord. It happened when they chose to be grateful instead of griping and complaining. So how do you talk to yourself when you're in trials, on pain, or in distress? How do you do this? We can take a cue from the life of David. David admitted that he was hurting, but he chose to put his trust in God. See, you don't go into denial. You say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting. God, I feel pain. But I choose to respond to you with praise, with honor, and with glory. Hallelujah. I'm going to look beyond my temporary discomfort, and I'm going to look to you. I'm going to set my eyes on you. I'm going to believe you, God. How many say yes and amen? When David chose to trust in the Lord, no wonder the Bible says in Psalms 20, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust the name of the Lord our God. There are times in life that the rug will be taken from under your feet. There will be times of distress, but we have to know in advance whom we have believed. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, that is why I am suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame, because I know in whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have in trusted to him until that day hallelujah in Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food food though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls yet will I rejoice in the Lord I will be joyful in God my Savior the sovereign Lord is my strength hallelujah some of y'all need to hear this word of encouragement for your life yet 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 in spite of what you see in spite it doesn't look like the prayer was answered I choose to rejoice and I say devil you are a liar feelings you don't describe who I am I'm not my feelings I choose the word of God that is my reality that's what I identify with the word of God hallelujah the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Hallelujah. What do you mean treading on the heights? See, where, see God says instead of, of, of going, instead of doing a premature landing, you go higher. You need to go higher. Hallelujah. God will set you on the high rock where most your enemies can go. Don't find sure footing. But God has made your feet like hinds deer. See, you have such a cup on your feet and you're on the rock and they're gonna have to pry you off but they can't hallelujah isaiah 40 do you not know have you not heard the lord is the everlasting god the creator of the end of the earth he will not grow tired or weary in his understanding no one can fathom he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Ho! Oh, how many need a strength renewal this morning? I know I do. Hallelujah. Say, my strength, hallelujah, is from him. My healing comes from him. My deliverance comes from him. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they shall be saved. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will not run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So how do you talk to yourself? Oh, the person I talk to the most is myself. Me, myself, and I have a bunch of conversations. I go through the day, and there's always a dialogue. And sometimes as a guy, I go into a nothing box. I says, what do you think about? Nothing. How can you be thinking of nothing? Nothing. Praise God. It's a guy thing. 
But how do you talk to yourself? You talk to yourself the Word of God. Talk to yourself the Word of God. You find strength in the Lord your God. There is no other way. God wants you to find your strength in Him so that you can encourage others. You cannot take others to a place you've never been. You cannot take others to a place you've never been. You are the tour guide. You say, oh, I've been through here before. Let me show you the way. Come on. <laughs> Come on now. I was in the miry pit, and God got me out. Hallelujah. I encouraged myself in the Lord. When it all appeared lost, God came to my defense. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You talk to yourself the word of God. You find your strength in the Lord your God. There is no other way. God wants you to find strength in him. Remember, the heavens and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. I want the, the worship team to come up. Praise God. So, when your soul wants to get in the dumps, how many have been there? Yeah, because I, Lord. I think I, want, I watched too many soap operas when I was a kid or some. God help me. It's a Latin thing, you know. Lord help us. But, you know, we're more like emotional, whatever. Lord help us. You know what? I'm going to find my strength in it. I'm going to proactively decide what I'm going to do. You know, in the military, we have protocols. If this happens, then we do this and this and this. And we have a, we begin to call each other because there are lists of how we communicate with one another. That's why we have protocols, right? In the armed forces, we do that. Why? Because it's for war. It's for war. Let's close our eyes. Do you realize that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places? But the weapons of our growth warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We take every thought captive. When every thought of self-compassion, oh, poor baby, I am not a victim, I'm a victor. Listen to me. You're not a victim, you're a victor. The enemy wants, to be a vict wants you to be a victim because then you will find an aggressor and an oppressor. Uh-uh, I don't think so. I am not oppressed, I am free in him are you with me I've been told I'm supposed to be oppressed well I'm not because he who the sun sets free he's free indeed and I don't identify with the color or ethnicity I identify I'm a child of the king I'm ch just a child of the king because from every race every tongue every nation hallelujah come on Stand to our feet. Hallelujah. When your soul wants to get you in the dumps, when your emotions want to get the best of you, ask your soul this question. Why my soul are you downcast? Come on, repeat after me. Why my soul are you downcast? <laughs> Come on. Don't look at me like I'm crazy because I do talk to myself. I've had conversations with my own soul. <laughs> and I said, why? My soul, are you downcast? See, your spirit man has the authority to speak to your, to your soul. What is your soul? Your mind, your thoughts, your emotions. Why my soul, are you, you so downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Remember the verse that we read? Why are you acting like that? Is something strange were happening to you? It's not strange. In the world you will have trouble. Trust in me, I have overcome the world. Why are you so disturbed within me? 
You just slap your soul here and there a little bit. Come on, wake up. Get it together. Suck it up, buttercup. You got to talk to your soul sometimes. Because what happens, there's a whole bunch of soulish believers who are moving in the soulish realm. But soulish believers are in the flesh and cannot reap anything of the spirit. Because he who sows to the flesh will reap destruction, but he who sows to the spirit will reap life. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Repeat after me. Put your hope in God. Come on, speak to your soul. Put your hope in God. Close your eyes. Put your hope in God. Speak to yourself. Put your hope in God. You got to hear yourself say it to, you, to yourself. Can we try that one more time? Close your eyes. Put your hope in God. Let your spirit man speak to your soul. Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him. Say it. For I will yet praise him. My Savior and my God. Let's keep your eyes closed. I've given you the prescription. I've given you a bug out kit. Hallelujah. You got to know the location. Where's the location of, of the word? In your heart, your word have I hid in my heart so that I might not sin against you. So that's why you got to memorize the word. You got to memorize the word. Because sometimes you don't have access to your phone or to your tablet or your computer. You got to have it. You got to plant it in your heart. You got to know it by the heart, literally. Hallelujah. May the Lord keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord give you peace. The Lord is turning your tears into dancing. He's putting off your sackcloth. I don't know if it makes any sense. The Lord says there is a before and an after today for you and in your family. And it's going to be a solution that will literally astonish you. Shaba Rabakaya. Come on, church. Come on. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for your presence. Lord, let us never, ever take your presence for God, for granted. Hallelujah. I bless you today in the name of the Lord. Let's give God a big, big, big hand. Hallelujah.